Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paulina Pascarelli, and I'm the mental health manager for the 15th Judicial Circuit in and for Palm Beach County, Florida. I'm a new NACA member and serve on the Early Career Professionals Subcommittee. Whether you're joining us here in the room or through our live stream, I'd like to give you a warm NACA welcome to this afternoon session, the update from the National Opioid Task Force. This session will focus on, focus on resources to help courts respond to the opioid crisis. You are encouraged to complete the evaluation at the end of this session using your NACOM app. Without further ado, our session presenters, New Mexico Supreme Court Chief Justice Judith Nakamura, who I believe I read is a hot air balloon pilot, <laughs> and Nora Sidhu, from the National Center for State Courts, who serves as staff to the National Judicial Opioid Task Force. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Nathan, for having us back. Last year, we had some task force members here, uh, Nora was one of them, to talk to you about the goals of the National Judicial Task Force. This year, we're here to talk to you about our accomplishments. And our big accomplishment is we have this extraordinary database uh, of practical, useful information that's going to really help courts, we hope, uh, navigate difficult issues associated with opioid abuse. But really, a lot of the information that's there is relevant to substance use disorder generally. So we really have a lot of information to cover. So we're going to jump right into it. What we plan to do is quickly review the bad news. And we know a lot of the bad news, but we have to talk about the bad news because if you really recognize how bad it is and how it's ravaging our community, it's got to spur us to action. Uh, then we're going to talk about the prevalence and impact of opioids in our country, the important role that courts have in addressing the epidemic, and then really the main uh, the focus of this uh, session is to talk to you about the tools and best practices that are available to help guide your response. So let's start with setting the stage with the bad news. Let's keep going. Um, over about an 18 year period from 1999 to 2017 in the United States there was over 700,000 deaths due to drug overdose and the bad news is that in 2017 alone there were over 70,000 overdose deaths about a 10% increase over 2016 about 130 people die a day uh, in the United States uh, due to opioid related overdoses opioids now count, account for 67% of all drug overdoses in the United States, and actually opioids are now the leading cause of accidental death. We know uh, that opioid use disorder has its origins in legally prescribed um, opioids. Is that slide two? Uh. And now it's estimated about 11 and a half million opioid abuse prescription, uh, about 11.5 million Americans abuse opioid prescriptions um, a year. About, uh, and that's about 19% or 2.1 million have an opioid use disorder themselves. There's nine states, unbelievable, I don't know if you're here, but nine states the number of prescriptions written for opioids actually exceeds the number of residents. And those states are Arkansas, Alabama, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, and West Virginia. And there are other illnesses that are now being associated uh, with the opioid epidemic. Recently, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention suggested that we have this really steep increase in uh, the cases of acute hepatitis C, and that's because of the increase in opioid injections. So this is being seen across the nation, across all age groups. So I think some of this material, maybe even this graphic itself, <laughs> was presented at the last session. So I um, don't want to spend too much time on it. But again, if, if it hasn't sunk in, um, the message of the, you know, the staggering number of opioid deaths in the country. There are some differences um, by gender, um, with males being um, slightly more, more at risk and prone to opioid deaths. Um, so we don't want to spend too much time on it. but. Again, trying to hit home the, the, uh, the extent of the epidemic um, and the loss of life. So again, another depiction. And, and as we know, and again, I think it was probably touched on last session, there are some geographic and regional trends that we certainly see, um, at least due in part to the extreme levels of poverty that exist in a lot of these communities that are um, highly rural, low unemployment rates, and just, just really high poverty. So there's definitely a, a connection there. 
Um, and we also know that there are incredible financial impacts that the, that the epidemic is placing on, on our community um, across the country. One group, um, Alterum, uh, a nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan group, has tried to quantify in dollars. Um, so they're estimating uh, that the U.S., um, it, that the opioid epidemic has cost the U.S. $1 trillion, um, which is a big, I like I'll let that sink in, that's a lot of dollars, uh, since 2001. Um, and you can see kind of the, the trend, you know, 2001 um, to, to now it's really jumped. So just in the past uh, three years, it's projected about $500 billion just, just in the recent couple years. But in the, in the different categories, so the healthcare costs, um, including Medicaid, I think it's estimated that, that somewhere between 9 and 14% of everyone on Medicaid has some sort of a substance use disorder um, problem. Uh, lost productivity, um, huge unemployment uh, rates among everyone with substance use disorder, but, but especially uh, folks battling opioid use disorder. Um, addiction treatment is very costly. Um, and then the, the, the huge criminal justice involvement. Um, so a lot of, lot of impact financially. Again, another slide about opioid uh, overdose deaths. So this slide is just a simple visualization of the spike in fentanyl overdose deaths. And I know that Dr. Westreich hit some of this, but um, fentanyl uh, has made our opioid drug overdose crisis even deadlier. And fentanyl and its analogs, although they're a synthetic opioid and they're cheaply manufactured in clandestine labs, and, and it's, they're 30 to 50 times more potent than heroin. So, as people have moved uh, from opioid painkillers, they're seeking out more potent, cheaper drugs and feeling the race to find a much more affordable high. So it's really no surprise that the death from synth synthetic opioids has really risen faster than um, opioid uh, deaths themselves. This is also a uniquely uh, American pro uh, problem. The United States accounts for 4.6% of the world population, yet, we account for 99.4% of the global hydrocodone supply. And we know that hydrocodone is a popular opioid used to treat severe pain. 99.4% of the supply of hydrocodone in the United States. Other countries, like the United Kingdom, uh, which account for, as you can see, about one quarter of a percent of the world's hydrocodone supply, they figured out other ways to address pain management that we in the United States have not yet. Um, this slide, again, I think hits home some of the things that we've already covered, but it, you know, there are a lot of health-related um, and community impacts, and we'll talk about a lot of these more when we get into the deliverables and the tools that we've worked on to help the judicial community. But um, you know, impacts on foster care resources, hospital demands, um, both you know, in serving adults and overdoses, you know, folks that are seen in the ER, but also with the infants born substance exposed and those infants um, that are diagnosed with neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, HIV and hepatitis C, like the chief mentioned, those, those uh, rates in many communities are just skyrocketing um, and a huge public health concern. Um, you know, labor and workforce impacts, uh, thefts and related crimes, addiction treatment services, detox, um, and then, like I said, I mentioned NAS newborns, and then truancy and education issues. This graphic um, comes from uh, the federal government. It just recognizes, again, I think hits home that, that some communities more than others um, are really uh, impacted by this epidemic um, and, you know, th that are, are particularly vulnerable to this, the, the public health issues um, with uh, HCV and HIV. So one of the things that the task force from uh, its creation has really been trying to hit home, like why is this a, an issue that uh, the national organizations, the Conference of Chief Justices and Conference of State Court Administrators need to get involved in, launch a task force, really get messages out. Um, it's this idea that you know this is not just a criminal justice issue. The the response of the task force and the judicial community, you know, we're not just talking about more adult drug courts. We're talking about every aspect of the court system um, is being impacted. All the case types, from you know, like I said, the dependency cases, the kids entering foster care because their parents have um, substance use and opioid use addiction, guardianships, um, conservatorships, the, the criminal justice categories that I think come to a lot of folks' minds certainly. Um, are, are significant. Bankruptcy and the financial impacts and the financial issues. 
uh, business and commercial transactions, workers' comp, insurance, divorce, custody, basically everything that you see, all your case types, just to one way or another are impacted by the opioid epidemic. Um, and I think you know one of the things that we've been talking about as the task force is developing their policies and tools is, is you know not just how the courts should respond in terms of programs and services, but how the courts um, can really try to I think get upstream. We're hearing that term a lot more. How can the courts and the judicial system, both at the state and local level, become more proactive in identifying populations and individuals that that are either at risk for these um, these issues, opioid or substance use, and then how can how can we help them before they um, a defendant in a criminal in a criminal docket. Um, so more about that soon. Well, I think as we know, substance use uh, leads to criminal justice involvement. So it should come as no surprise that other than self referral, the criminal justice system, you, our judges, have now become the single largest source of referral to substance abuse treatment. So I'm going to pause for one second. We're going to kind of start to dive into the, to the meat of the work that we've been doing, the tools, the policy recommendations. But again, we hope that this is um, a little interactive. Uh, but I just wanted to really quick, if you're willing, um, ask folks what you're interested in getting out of this presentation, partly because we've done a lot of work and we could probably talk to you for three or four hours about the tools and resources. So we want to hone in on giving you what, what you hope to get out of this. So anything in particular you want to make sure we cover? Any topic areas, any needs that you're having? The chief said I could call him the New Mexico contingent in the back if, it, if it's really quiet. So I gave them the answer. Okay. The tools. <laughs> well, I know it's a national task force, but I'd be interested to see what we could do on our level as court staff. We'll get into that. Great. Point was to see what can be done locally, and we'll address some of the tools and, and what there is in that respect. Great. If you have um, any information on juvenile use, we will hit that. Yep. Co-occurring disorders. Co-occurring disorders. Great. Mm -hmm. We'll go ahead and talk about some of the courts then that we have. Both in juvenile justice and in child welfare cases, the judges should be asking questions, even though we don't have any idea what the answers might be, but what tools and what training is contemplated for the judiciary to better be focusing not just themselves, but those in the courtroom on addressing this issue. Okay. Perfect. Great. All right. Well, that gives us a good idea. And selfishly, I wanted to ask, the task force is, is still working. It'll conclude uh, this fall with a final report and recommendations. But I uh, did want to hear, like, what's on your mind in case we missed something. So that, that gives us a good picture. Thanks. So again, like I mentioned, the opioid epidemic, and I'm sure you've all seen the headlines in, the, in your local papers. Um, I'd be surprised if you haven't seen some story, either whether it's local or national, about the impact of the opioid epidemic on the foster care system. Um, and in some communities, some states, it's been particularly um, drastic, um, the numbers of kids coming into foster care because their parent has a, an opioid use disorder or co-occurring disorders. Um, so the best data that we have um, comes from the obligation that all the state child welfare agencies have to the federal government to report twice a year data and statistics for every kid that's in out-of-home care. So that the system is called AFCARS. Um, so one of the things that the state's code is the reason or reasons for removal. So that's the data that you see charted here. So all the way on the left is uh, 2000. So back then you see the statistic um, below 25% or below 20% in terms of the, the number of kids in foster care who were removed because of a parent's substance use disorder. Um, that number has grown um, to 2016 to over 35% for a jump of 16.8%. Um, however, I mean, I think it's it's pretty commonly recognized that, that there's some flaws with this system, <laughs> partly because it, it's, a, it's a coding data issue. Um, states and, and caseworkers can code simply neglect instead of specifically parental substance use. So it's just probably coded wrong. I mean, I think 
I would hazard to guess if any of you go into your local court's dependency docket and listen to those cases, um, I would say upwards of 80 to 90 percent on average, um, you're going to hear substance use disorder. Might not be opioids, but in some communities, as we know, and we'll talk about a little more, it's, it's meth, it's not opioids, but substance use disorder is among the reasons, among the allegations against the parents in those cases. Um, but, but regardless, whatever that number is, we know it's growing, um, and in, you know, in part due to the opioid epidemic. Again, another, another slide that shows, you know, back in 2007, we had close to 500,000 kids nationally in out-of-home placement, which includes foster care, kinship care, care um, and, and group homes, so it's kind of that catch-all category. We've done a lot of work nationally and, and locally to, to make improvements in the foster care system, to bring kids to permanency faster, to get them in, into families, whether it's, it's you know, through adoption or reunification. So that number dropped by 2012. It was down below 400,000, um, but then we're seeing you know, by 2017, um, it's, it's climbing back up, and, and the consensus is um, among a few other things, but largely in part due to the national opioid epidemic and the impact that that's having on, on families. It's definitely a, a big issue. So the federal government, um, through ASPE, has done some studies. They looked at, um, particularly in Florida, a lot of the data came from Florida, but they looked at the county level on opioid deaths and then also compared that um, in their you know, fancy statistical correlation kind of way, uh, correlated it with removals and, and kids in foster care and definitely found a correlation. Um, basically, they're trying to answer that question, is the opioid epidemic um, at least partly correlated uh, to um, the, the increase in foster care. And they definitely found a correlation. Um, it was a, uh, I don't know all the, multi-method study. So they did things including interview judges and, and court professionals about what they were seeing, but they were also you know, looking at, at uh, uh, statistics, um, so both qualitative and quantitative data. So the task force, again, has done a lot of work in this area, um, which is why I keep going on, <laughs> on about uh, some of these trends. I mentioned earlier, I mean, we, we certainly know that the, and again, I, I probably um, would hazard a guess that you've all seen some sort of headline, whether it's locally or nationally, about um, the incidence of neonatal abstinence syndrome um, connected to the opioid epidemic. Um, and in some communities, uh, the, the, the numbers are, are just astonishing. Um, in 2006, uh, it was estimated around 220,000 infants were born um, per, uh, with neonatal abstinence syndrome due to uh, prenatal substance exposure. So you see over here, you know, some of the characteristics. There are short-term impacts. Um, a lot of it, you know, is is you know, uh, behavior. You know, they're hard to console. They are hard to you know, they have a hard time eating, they're just crying, they're, you know, a lot of, a lot of those short term, um, and then some longer term impacts. We're still, you know, the, the studies are still um, ongoing in terms of, we, we, to be honest, we don't know, I think, we don't have a good picture of the long term impacts on some of these babies. Um, so we know the impact of opioids uh, in our communities, and if you didn't, hopefully this gave you a little bit of a primer on that. And so it's no, it's no surprise that a lot of national organizations uh, from the President's Commission on Opioids, the National Governors Association, the National Attorney General's Association, over the years everyone's been attacking this problem. But guess what? As they spoke about it, they spoke about it in terms of the federal courts. Well, the problem with that is it's the state courts which are handling 95% of the cases across the country. And each day really are the ones uh, dealing with the impact of the opioid epidemic. Next slide. So the president um, of the Conference of Chief Justices, Maureen O'Connor, uh, decided with the blessing of the Conference of Chief Justices and the uh, court state court administrators, uh, formed the National Judicial Opioid Task Force to develop resources for courts and uh, recommend policy and best practices for your courts. Let's go to the next slide. And it, anyone here from Tennessee uh, or Indiana? We're so different. 
Tennessee. Well, then you recognize Deborah Taylor Tate. These are the two ladies and Chief Justice Rush from Indiana who have driven this task force. Um, just a, a phenomenal job. I can't say enough wonderful things about them except time is tight, so I'm going to move to our next slide. Um, fired. <laughs> So, uh, by my, uh, the task force, and that was the prior slide, I'll just quickly tell you what it said. There were three work groups. You have the slide in your materials, but what I wanted to point out to you, 24 states were involved in helping us develop these materials. So half of you have resources already available to you out in the states, and, and again, take a look at the materials that are in your uh, packet. Let's go to the next slide. These are... Um, uh, to help us get our work done, what we decided to do in a very short way, this very short amount of time, and came up with these five principles that should serve as a framework for our work group, group as well as the courts. Um, you have to have a comprehensive approach, and we're not talking just about opioids. The materials we came up with also address substance use disorder uh, generally. Obviously, you need to have all uh, hands on deck, judges, the courts, you need to pull together all of the other stakeholders in the community. Treatment has to target, uh, be individualized, and that can be achieved used, uh, utilizing validated screening and assessment instruments. Obviously, we have to protect children and support families with interventions that incorporate um, a continuum of treatment services, and you must make a data-driven decision uh, and ensure that the, there's quality in data collection uh, in order to assess performance. So this, this slide just quickly shows you the activities of the task force. There's a lot of documents we're going to tell you about in just a minute called deliverables. They're nearly complete. I'm going to discuss those with you. Policy developments in place is going on right now. And later this week, the Conference of Chief Justices is meeting. And there's about 36 to 40 policy recommendations that are going to get released later this week and be put up on our website. These are important because they're written in terms of what courts and judges should be doing um, in their state. So take a look uh, on our website. Hopefully next week we're going to have this information up. And the dissemination phase is where we are now. Then what I want to tell you is that we have gone across the country trying to address every major group across the country, and that's ongoing. But if you in your state want someone there specifically to address opioid use disorder, we will send someone there, and you have all of our contact information. So, Nora, why don't you, you start by telling us what's available specifically? Yeah, so um, really almost from the beginning, the task force um, really started developing tools. We wanted the work of the task force to really be practical. We knew that we would develop policy recommendations, but really wanted um, tools, you know, things that court administrators, court professionals, court partners, and judges could, could use to either become better educated about some of these issues, you know, the brain science of addiction, or learn about some innovations or court policies or programs um, that we were seeing, like the Buffalo Opioid Court um, and some of these new things. Um, so we created a website because we um, do that at, at the National Center. We have a really great website uh, that's very interactive. Um, it not only includes uh, tools and products from the task force, but it really is a clearinghouse. Um, you know, we're not the be-all, end-all of, of all things opioids and courts. There's a lot of material that was already out there, so we, you know, we served in that clearinghouse function. Um, we coordinated, collaborated um, with a lot of organizations and organized things by topics, whether it was, you know, kind of special populations, or a lot of research, a lot of data and information, a lot of tools already out there. So, so it's clearinghouse, but it was also, it's, and it is also the place to go to get all of these products that we're about to tell you about. Um, and so most of the tools that we'll describe in just a couple minutes are, you know, kind of hard copy PDF. We think of them as, you know, some are bench cards, but kind of like your fact sheet things. Um, but we've also hold, held several webinars, um, some on PDMPs, um, a webinar on understanding addiction, the brain science, you know, a lot of the material that you heard in the last plenary session. Um, we heard from some of our federal partners on um, the impact of the foster care system and what is the court's role along that prevention continuum. You know, how can judges get upstream um, and, and help families before they're in crisis mode? Um, a lot of different formats to the, to the tools that we've developed. 
So I staff the children and families uh, working group at the in the task force. The bulk of the work that I do at the center as a consultant is is in the children and families area, in particular with foster care. Um, so this is uh, I think all of our deliverables to date are on this screen. And again, so this PowerPoint slide is in your online materials through the app. But also we have a one pager front and back that lists all the task force deliverables. I think they're. 24 to date in all the working groups and they're, they're all described you get a little icon or a link a, a link and a description of what it is so it's a really great resource so that's in your in your online materials too for this session so we knew that, um, you know what was in the purview of our work um, mostly foster care again you know we, we can't underscore enough the impact this epidemic has had on the foster care system but we also wanted to address um, the juvenile justice system and adolescence I think someone mentioned um, in the what are you interested in the you know the the youth where are the youth in all of this um, so I'll kind of just walk through these deliverables and, and this is definitely the point where I encourage you if you have questions or if you want to clarify anything that we described please feel free we've got a mic uh, just raise your hand so, um, so two of our deliverables are related to the impacts um, of opioid use on when pregnant women uh, use opioids. Um, so we originally developed them as a single document, but it was very voluminous. There's a lot of information out there. Um, so we split it into one focuses on um, addressing the needs of pregnant women who have opioid use disorder. Um, SAMHSA, the federal government's uh, SAMHSA, uh, released last February clinical guidance. It was, I think, a two-year um, collaborative with a lot of uh, medical practitioners and you know the country's smartest people on on pregnancy and, and opioid addiction developed very lengthy clinical guidance around pregnancy and treatment so really trying to answer and, and not trying addressing that question is MAT safe for pregnant women and how you know what what, what should the approach look like so that deliverable really just summarizes what you find in that um, I think it's like dozens of pages long clinical guidance. So we save you, save you some trouble of skimming through that whole thing. And then we focused another deliverable on the needs of infants and those um, born substance exposed. So we talk about NAS, we define it. Um, we talk about the, the, the change over the past several years in the approach to treating NAS. Um, you know, for a long, long time, the approach was um, using medicine basically to soothe uh, morphine and other things to soothe the symptoms that these babies were experiencing. Um, but there have been several recent studies, um, you know, basically kind of rethinking that approach. Uh, the eat, sleep, console method, you might have heard about it. It's been in some of these national media stories on NAS. But, but basically, it's, it's just recognizing that um, there are things besides medicine that can help these babies. Um, you know, contact with the mom, breastfeeding if appropriate, um, you know, the rooming in, um, calm, low stimulus environments, um, all of those things have proven as effective, if not more effective, than, than pharmacotherapy. So it talks about that. It talks about like what judges need to know about plans of safe care, about um, you know some of the, the needs of, of these two populations um, and it, it focuses on for, for the judges you know what can judges do on the bench in individual cases and then off the bench any questions okay um, I'm gonna I feel like I'm gonna talk fast because we have a lot to cover and not a lot of time so we developed one deliverable, and they're called different things. You, I've seen them probably most often called parent partner programs, um, but these are kind of like your, your recovery coaches that, that you see in your adult drug court programs. But the idea is connecting parents that are going through the child welfare system with parents in recovery who have had similar experiences. Um, there's a growing body of research and evidence that shows these are very effective. Um, they look different in different communities. Some are kind of run through the court system some are through child welfare, some are through a local nonprofit or a civil legal aid organization. Um, so there's different models, but it's, it's definitely um, recognized, I think, or, or becoming more recognized as, as, a, as a really effective strategy. So we have a deliverable about that. Um, we, again, I mentioned the webinar that we did earlier in the year with the feds and um, the commissioner of the Children's Bureau on the role of courts in prevention, talking about, uh, and then we, 
we did a we just summarized it in a in a handout. But talking about again both the, the judge's role on the bench, things like reasonable efforts findings, um, but then off the bench, you know, judges using their their convening superpower uh, to to gather community stakeholders and address you know treatment gaps and some of the other um, needs that communities have. Judges are are very um, skilled at, at getting things done like that. So uh, we talk about that. Um, we have a deliverable again. Someone mentioned um, the the needs of uh, adolescents. Um, so we have a deliverable that talks about what are the trends, what does the data say around opioid use among adolescents. It's certainly um, from a you know population standpoint, um, they're not using it at some of the, the rates that we're seeing. The older, like 18 to 24, that's for a long time has been uh, the core population. Um, but we know that there are, especially in some communities, um, adolescents uh, using. So we wanted to address what are their needs and then issues around MAT, uh, medically assisted treatment. Um, there are recommendations now coming out of you know the American Academy of Pediatrics, for example, um, and the federal government and SAMHSA about um, the efficacy of MAT for adolescents. Am I missing anything? Oh, we have another deliverable for the juvenile justice population. I think through not just our work, but I think all of the um, all of the working groups is is this issue of trauma. Um, you know, we're, we're, we've learned so much in the past several years about what experiencing trauma does, um, especially at an early age, um, for you know the, the infants and toddlers and young kids, their studies, the adverse childhood experiences study, ACEs study, you've probably heard about it now. Um, it really, I mean, it, it changes their brains and has lifelong um, impacts and it impacts their health, not just their, you know, education outcomes, but, but like, you know, their incidence of heart disease and cancer. Um, so we've become pretty smart about the impacts of trauma, and, and I think that courts are definitely becoming uh, more trauma-informed about, you know, what this means, but then trauma-responsive. So we have a, a deliverable that really talks about the specific needs of the juvenile justice um, involved population and trauma. Um, and that's, that's an overview of, of our work. Okay. So I chaired the um, civil and criminal justice workforce. It would take me two days to get through all this material, so I'm going to quickly tell you what's there, and then you could look at this material so you could become experts on many of these subjects. One of our documents, Understanding the Basics of Addiction, I think that document is best described as providing uh, a starting point information on addiction. It does talk about a couple of the innovative programs that are in use right now, including the Buffalo Court that you referred to. There's a program in Tennessee, uh, the Tennessee Rocks program called the Recovery Oriented Compliance Strategy, as well as the Norfolk Virginia Circuit Court Reentry Docket. There are links to specifically to those programs, as well as people who would be happy to give you lots of information about them. But that Understanding the basics of addiction in addition to giving you information like the definition of addiction, the contributing factors from environmental, biological trauma, medical conditions. It, it does, uh, with respect to some of the more sobering information that's in this deliverable, so for example that folks with opioid use disorder in the criminal justice system, they're 13 times more likely to continue to be involved in the criminal justice system because of opioid use disorder. So what do you do? You look at this deliverable. It provides you information on how to treat opioid use disorder, including the necessity for MAT. But I think the real value of this document is the compilation of links, extensive links, um, that's going to greatly enhance one's knowledge about any aspect of addiction that includes medical consequences, other co-occurring disorders, information on the three medications Dr. Whitrich talked about, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. Um, so great resource, basic information will educate you further on those other courts. Treatment of opioid use disorders, I'll come back to the other in just a moment. Uh, the third one down there, it provides you information also again on medication assisted treatment, evidence that underlies uh, treatment types for opioid use disorder, best practices, and legal implications. Uh, Matt is addressing there in terms of uh, evidence-based and best practices. Um, talks about how to tackle um, this, uh, this, we know that cessation of drug use alone is not going to return your brain to normal, right? So, and relapses are going to be expected. So, we, how do you tackle all of this? Um, and we know it's medication use in conjunction with behavioral health therapy. 
is how you tackle it. That's optimal. You've got to put both of them together. But research does suggest that the medications are a more effective aspect of the treatment. And it talks about the medications, methadone, buprenorphine, and maltrexone. Um, and by the way, it does, it does point out that there is no scientific basis for concluding that one um, medication is superior to other except for one. When it comes to treating pregnant women, buprenorphine is known to be superior. Um, because fetal outcomes are better. So there's information on that in that document, uh, document information on naloxone is also available, which we know is an overdose reversal medication. And um, most importantly, there's a lot of information in there regarding legal implications. We know that um, Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, a person with an OUD, an opioid use disorder, is a qualified individual with a disability. So you've got to take a look at that document. There's information also on the HIPAA privacy rules. Uh, substance abuse confidential regulations may be implicated. Okay, so you have to keep that in mind. We also have a document uh, out called Involuntary Commitment and Guardianship Laws for a Person with Substance Use Disorder. At the time we issued that document in October of 2018, there were 35 states and the District of Columbia had enacted involuntary commitment laws for those suffering from alcoholism and substance use disorders. Now look, states vary greatly uh, on the criteria to be applied before you can be involuntarily commitment for, uh, committed for a substance use disorder. There are some commonalities you'll see. So for example, there has to be an evaluation by a medical professional, certification regarding the need for intensive treatment. Uh, the person committed may seek a writ of habeas corpus. Um, they need to be represented by an attorney. The shortfall is that the laws do not mandate continuing treatment um, after an individual is released. And that's where court intervention becomes really important for follow-up. That's key. Um, laws, these laws, interestingly, are rarely, if ever, used. But this is really good resource. If your state is looking uh, to do something with your involuntary commitment or your guardianship laws or your legislature's thinking about it, uh, there are citations for all 38 states in this document. Great resource. Fentanyl, fentanyl um, and their analogs in the courthouse. This is a bench card. This is what a lot of this stuff looks like to make it useful to your, to your judges as well. This paper provides information on the risks they present, precautionary measures that have to be implemented by courts. Um, you heard, and I won't repeat all of it, but these are synthetic opioids. And they are uh, powerful anesthetics, not only for humans, but for uh, mammals as well. Um, the fentanyl is approved for uh, human pain relief. It's 30 to 50 times more potent than heroin. Uh, carfentanil tranquilizes elephants and uh, other large mammals, and it's 100 times more potent than fentanyl. And due to the, and someone asked about this, due to that potency, small quantities are being mixed with drugs to produce larger quantities of illegal drugs, increasing traffic or profits. That's a lot of what it's about. And about two years ago, we started hearing these reports, and you've probably seen some in the news about first responders becoming ill when they were coming in contact, either touching or breathing, um, and, and uh, fentanyl, and it caused some respected organizations to uh, conclude um, that incidental contact is unlikely to cause opioid toxicity. But you have to take uh, precautions. First responders have to take precautions. So a number of criminal justice entities, like courts, are now uh, protecting court personnel who may have to handle these drugs. This is a controversial issue. And it's controversial because some physicians are now saying, look, there's this overreaction in an incidental exposure. It's unlikely to present a serious health issue. However, it is uncontroverted that greater exposure can be deadly. So what are courts to do? What are you to do? Well, you can read this document. It's going to help you. But in particular, if you are trying cases in your courthouses that will necessitate bringing these drugs into your courthouse, you have to ensure the safety of those handling the drug and the public exposed uh, if these drugs are mishandled. So what do you need to do? You have to have conversations and you must establish guidelines which address the safe packaging and inspection of these substances when they're coming into your courthouses. Who can transport them within your courthouse? Rules need to be established. What are you going to do if these need to come in as evidence in your courthouse? 
You need to also be sure that you have trained personnel to address toxic exposure, including administration of naloxone. In Massachusetts, do I have anyone from Massachusetts here? The Massachusetts courts, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I understand the Massachusetts courts have banned the substance being brought into the courthouses. You cannot take it in, even if that's what the trial is about. So um, the, the court system in Massachusetts has decided that the accidental exposure to these drugs and the possible consequences outweigh the need to present the actual drug in court. So photographs can come in, but there's also, um, the, a, a judge certainly could also decide the drug must be presented. But then they have specially trained personnel, I understand, for handling these drugs in court. So there are other, in this document, uh, other entities in the criminal justice system in this country, as well as other countries, are discussed. The, part, the best I can tell you right now is courts must have a conversation on what you're going to do, every court, if these substances need to come in. There's also a, a, a deliverable on the lots on use in the courthouse. It also is sort of in the bench, court, uh, bench card format. It describes a sign of an overdose, what to do if it occurs, how naloxone can be used to reverse toxic effects uh, of an overdose, and uh, suggestions for a naloxone policy. Again, it does set out the common symptoms, what happens if this person passes out in front of you, how to recognize if it's an overdose, opioid overdose, so that you can uh, decide what you're going to do. And it talks to you, what are you going to do? Well, first thing you're going to do, the car tells you, is you're going to call 911. Then you're going to administer naloxone, and that's usually administered in the court type setting as a nasal spray. And communities throughout the country, and you check your local department of health, they will come in and treat all your personnel. There are some states that are making uh, the spray available free within courthouses or at a very minimal cost. There are communities in this country that every community member who will come to, be, to learn how to administer uh, Narcan are being trained. Conversation that you have to have, time is of the essence. So this uh, bench card emphasizes the importance of your court having in place policy and procedures that ensure the training of personnel who come in contact with folks who might be overdosing um, on an opioid. Fundamentals of screening and assessment in the uh, justice system describes the purpose of SUD um, generally, substance use disorder generally, screening and assessment. It also gives you some links to some free or low cost screening and assessment tools uh, that can be used in your courts. We know that uh, every usage of evidence-based screening and assessment, it's more likely that you're going to ensure effective matching of offenders with the uh, treatment uh, services. And if you match people with what they need, obviously we're going to have more positive outcomes, right? What's important to note is that screening is just the initial step. Uh, whether a person is sub uh, suffering from an SUD um, as well as a possible co-occurring disorder like uh, a mental illness. You should know that 70% of offenders that we see in our courts have a substance use disorder and up to 34% of them, 34% also have a co-occurring um, uh, serious mental illness as well. And if you treat one without the other, it's going to be rather challenging in terms of outcomes. So, Screening questions, you should know. Uh, they're usually yes, no. There's very specific instructions on how to administer them. You don't need specially trained staff. Uh, but if we're, then if you go to the assessment stage, it's lengthier, it's a more detailed questionnaire, and specially trained folks do need to do that. Finally, for now, um, there is a uh, promising strategy. Here it is, the bottom one, in providing opioid use disorder treatment to rural uh, frontier um, and underserved communities. Uh, obviously, um, it provides information on the barriers to treatment for OUD in rural areas and what some states are doing to overcome those barriers. Um, court, when you think about the barriers to treatment in rural America, in addition to the complications needed by having to travel so far to get services, there's a lack of providers, uh, there's a bias against MAT, there's limited funding, there's a stigma as Dr. Weisrich referred to it being labeled an addict that drives uh, some needing help into hiding. So courts are dealing with these obstacles in multiple ways and there's three really good examples in this document of how they're doing it. One is called OBOT, office-based opioid treatment where they are using methadone, naltrexone, and buprenorphine and protocols are associated with the first two we know. There's accessibility and usefulness problems. But the buprenorphine um, can be prescribed by nurse practitioners. Uh, and this is a place where uh, courts have assembled folks to uh, get more of these professionals trained into uh, administering it, obtaining the waivers, completing the training necessary. That should be encouraged. Um, 
the Hub and Spoke model, which is uh, started in 2012 in Vermont. And what they've done is they have these hubs, a specialized uh, addiction treatment clinics with addiction specialists. They can perform physical and mental health uh, evaluations. Uh, the spokes are special care teams located throughout the states, including the drug courts. But here's, I encourage you to look at this. Vermont has experienced a 96% decrease in opioid use through the, the model that's discussed in this document. And finally, there's telehealth. Uh, which is discussed in this document as well. And telehealth uh, is technology from a remote location to uh, deliver virtual services to patients. And this actually began in New Mexico, so I love to talk about it very briefly. It's Project ECHO. It's based in New Mexico. It's now being used throughout the world. And what it does is it combines primary and specialty care, linking experts with these specialty teams from an academic hub with primary care physicians out in the field. And so these two sides are consulting with each other through teleconference. And the primary focus of Project ECHO now has become teaching primary care physicians throughout New Mexico how to treat those with substance use disorders and specifically uh, opioid use disorder. Um, so uh, th these, all three of those models are something that can easily be replicated in your state. You want to hit the collaboration work group? Sure. Okay. But isn't she great? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited. This yeah, is great one of the, out here. Yeah, one of the, the strengths of the, the task force has been the leadership. So each working group is chaired by a Supreme Court Chief Justice and a State Court Administrator. And it's not just in name only and like with their picture on the website. I mean, they push their sleeves up and have worked tirelessly and have been true champions and leaders. Um, so we are, we are grateful. But I see a hand. Yes. Oh, I can hear you. National Association Drug Court Professionals do a lot of multidisciplinary training. Right. right. But, and, and obviously, it, from a court's perspective, we have the resources that the NCSC can provide and all of our own you know, state court liaisons. But I'm wondering, on the prosecutorial side and on the defense side, as to their professional bodies, are there similar arms for education that address might be applicable to their professions uniquely? I believe we, uh, we've actually gone out to a number of those organizations already. We're, and I think, Nora, you've been involved in some of that. Yes. So the the third working group, uh, the collaboration and education yes. working group, um, is kind of twofold. One is to focus on kind of at the at the local trial court level, what are the education needs and and the collaboration activities that the courts could be more involved with. But also at the state and the national level, what what can the court community and how can the court community partner with some of these other organizations? So, you know, for example, like the National Association of Attorneys General, um, we have been meeting with a lot of these organizations and really trying to to work together um, on, on some of these. One, that so we don't like you know duplicate efforts, and but that we have you know coordinated and and you know shared that yes. Um, so does that answer your question at all? And the tribal courts as well. We've been reaching out to as a part of the collaboration and education group. Yeah, so I'll, I'll skim through some of these. Um, but, but but again, you know, collaboration at the at the national level, but also the local level. So, uh, like the chief said, a lot of the tools um, and deliverables from this working group focus on um, collaborating with the tribal communities. So we have several. One um, just focuses on building cultural competencies, um, which is a great has been a great tool and resource. Um, uh, we have a sample court transfer agreement, so it's a it's a model transfer agreement between um, state courts and tribal courts. Um, so uh, you know where you know because we know most state courts have better you know adult drug court and, and programs and services, um, and and vice versa. So depending on the needs of the community, having a a transfer agreement, um, and then. Somewhat similarly, a sample court transfer agreement between state and federal courts. So federal courts definitely don't have the, the, the resources, the services, the programs um, for this population like state courts do. So it's a transfer agreement. I think the model originally, I, I don't know if they were the first ones, but Montana um, developed a, a similar protocol between its district courts and its state courts, where you know district court would have a criminal defendant with substance use disorder and could really benefit from an, a state court drug court program. So it was a transfer agreement that they developed that we really turned right. into a, a model. And it's been a lot of interest um, on both of these. 
Uh, we've got an SUD uh, dictionary for quartz, you know, that glossary of like, what does MAT really mean? What is naloxone? <laughs> kind of the, the, the encyclopedia. Um, how to create a local or regional opioid task force. We have a deliverable on uh, words matter. The chief mentioned stigma, and I think you heard about it in the plenary. I mean, that this issue and this theme has been huge, and we've really spent a lot of time as a task force focusing on on the barriers that stigma presents to to individuals with with substance use disorder. So words that you know become kind of commonplace in courts like a dirty screen or addict. Um, there are more strength-based ways to 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 use uh, and to phrase a lot of these things. And it really, I mean, on the surface, it might sound like a, a little silly, but we we have learned and understand that it really does make a difference and have a huge impact on um, on these individuals with with needs. You know, reducing the barriers to treatment and and things like that. Um, what am I missing, Chief? Oh, the sequential intercept. Um, model. Um, raise your hand if you know what the sequential intercept model is. Okay, a couple of you. Um, how many of you, you have used it in your community? Okay, so this is on the criminal justice side, so this is not my area of forte, but uh, I, will, I will present you the 101 level <laughs> explanation of what it is, um, and there, thankfully, is a deliverable. You can pull up and read about it, but it's a, like a conceptual framework that was developed by SAMHSA's Gain Center about 20 years ago with the idea of really preventing, identifying that folks with substance use disorder and behavioral health needs ultimately um, will become embedded and you know further into the criminal justice system. So the, the framework identified five different intercepts, they called it, um, like the, the pre, you know, pre-law enforcement, pre-everything, like the way upstream and then law enforcement, the courts, post-core like re-entry. Um, and, and the idea is that the community can address the needs of this population at these different intercepts, again, with the goal of preventing, you know, again, the, the idea is how to not let the criminal justice system be the treatment provider of, for folks with mental health issues and substance use issues. So the, the, it's really a tool. So communities get together, hold a workshop or a series of workshops, look at these, and so you bring like all the stakeholders and not just like the stakeholders, like everyone that touches these communities together and you identify the gaps, the strengths, you develop an action plan and you actually like do something about it. It's been extremely effective, um, we're learning or we've learned. Um, so this deliverable describes the model and really encourages communities to take advantage of it. This is really- This is a biggie. Yeah, this is a biggie. That's this I'm really excited about, so I'm gonna tell them about it. Okay. Um, <laughs> This is a uh, partnership that is occurring, this goes to our dissemination phase of our project, but basically uh, it's ensuring that you have in your individual states the resources you need. So what's happening in November, the Judicial College, the AAAP task force, they're hosting this National Judicial Opioid Training Conference. It's a train the trainer sort of event. And just about every chief justice in the country has identified a judge in their state that's gonna be going to this training. They're gonna be paired with medical and psycho uh, psychiatric experts on addiction treatment and judicial responses. Then they're gonna go back to their state and help train even more people. They're gonna be responsible, like I said, they're going back to your state and helping you. They're your resource when it comes to opioid use disorder as well as substance use disorder. We have up here uh, a partial list. I think most states have now identified, but if you're wondering who your uh, representative is, come up and see us. Um, uh, and, and if your state hasn't identified something, then we'll send you back to your Chief Justice or AOC to help us get <laughs> someone identified, because this is a big deal. All right, we did, um, with the few minutes we have left, um, I'll, I'll skim through these. I mean, we wanted to just give you some further examples of some of the, the programs, the innovative, like the Buffalo Opioid want, Court. You wanna talk about opioid, the, the Buffalo program? Did you know about the Buffalo program? You want us to give you, okay. I, so, I if, been. you've been, okay. Okay. So yeah, we're seeing more and more specialty courts focused on the unique needs and, and responses to folks with opioid use disorder, like um, the first opioid court in the country in Buffalo, New York. Um, other specialty courts, um, let's see, we'll talk. 
talk about. So Florida, um, related to the children and families population, Florida is a great example of, um, they're called different things. Florida calls them early childhood courts. Um, some of your communities might call them zero to three courts, baby courts, infant toddler courts. Um, but the, the idea is it's a specialty problem solving court for dependency cases. Um, the age criteria differs. Sometimes it's zero to three or zero to five, but, but the, the, you know, the, it recognizes that these dependency cases and the families involved in them have unique needs, that babies and toddlers, um, like the attachment issues and, and the needs of those infants um, are, are unique. And so it's a, um, it's a problem solving court that focuses on that relationship between the parent child. So it's, you know, encourages frequent and quality visitation. Um, uh, uh, key component, like in Florida, um, they've recognized parent-child psychotherapy as a as a key service. Um, Florida, I think, is. is I think the only example I know um, where a state has really been working hard to, to roll this model out statewide. They've been testing it um, through collaboration with a university. I can't remember which one. Maybe one of you Florida people can, can tell me. But um, really studied it, evaluated Florida State. Um, but but to, to really test, does this model work? Sometimes as you know, courts jump in and say, hey, we're going to develop this new program and we think it works. But, but they really, really uh, studied it, know it works. Um, so that's definitely a good model. Um, can it, can, it says Kentucky, the model actually started in Ohio, but it's the START program, it's for dependency cases or, or foster care, not all, all of you call them dependency cases, but the, the unique features of the program are pairing, kind of back to that parent partner program, but the Child Welfare Agency actually has on staff trained um, recovery coaches, but parents that have gone through the child welfare system that are paired with the parent um, that really focus on um, intensive, kind of the wraparound approach. Um, it started in Ohio, very successful, um, very successful outcomes, both in reunification and, and getting to permanency faster. So it's expanding to other jurisdictions. Um, I know we just have a couple minutes. I'm trying to decide, like, what do we want? <laughs> Any dying questions that you really want to ask before our last minute is up? PDMPs. That's a, this is an important one, um, and has some model um, programs. You know the, um, the the slide forty. When we confront an epidemic, targeting a high risk populations, prevention treatment is critical. Right? North Carolina just released a study. Um, the jail uh, risk of overdose deaths in jail. This one, North Carolina just released a study, and what they found is that in the first two weeks after release from prison, former inmates were 40 times more likely to die of an opioid um, uh, overdose than someone in general population. So there's ob an obvious population we have to be looking to, and one reason is that formerly incarcerated individuals have already been forced to withdraw during incarceration, and they have a low tolerance. Uh, when they're released. And secondly, there are very few support systems that are in place for inmates on release, on release including a lack of health care. So um, don't have time to go into it, but there are two really innovative programs, Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Uh, key to both programs is MAT, pre and post release. Um, and there's a paper called Treatment of Opioid Use Disorder on the website that talks to you a little bit more about these programs and links you up to them. So, Thank you. Tell us about that. Um, so we, I think we're pretty much out of time. Um, the, the, if you have a question, I, and if you, you, there's something that's not answered on that website, like I said, we're trying to wrap up our work by November. I think it's an incredible database. It's full of links. It's full of resources. Um, so please take this information back to your states. Share it with your colleagues. Share it with your judges. And call us. Uh, if you need us to send someone out, particularly Hawaii, I'll personally go, uh, <laughs> and, and help you uh, address this epidemic in your states. Thank you for being here. And we want to thank again the State Justice Institute Super. has provided generous support to the task force from the beginning. So we can't thank them enough for supporting this work. Thank you.